If you are alive, your dream has not died. It's time to reveal who you are. When I wrote that song, I had the image in my mind of opening a letter, opening a love letter, opening a love note, revealing the contents of that letter. And this is what we get to do as we live our lives, revealing the most beautiful, loving, kindest, good parts of ourselves. The world is asking for it. The world is asking, clamoring for you to reveal the goodness that, of God that is you, to reveal the joy, the beauty of God that is you. Are you ready to be more? More of what you were created to be. Not more of what your mother thinks you should be. Not more of what some institution said you should be. But more of what you were created to be. Yes, yes? Beautiful. Well, thank you, Soul 21, as always for your amazing voices and amazing ministry. Good morning, CSC. How are we doing? How are we feeling? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I'm getting the impression that a lot of people are excited about this one series, which is very good, very good. Um, the Matrix Trilogy is, is one of my absolute favorites. Um, I, I personally consider uh, The Matrix, particularly the first movie, um, if I were to have my own personal Bible, I would put it in my personal Bible um, and, and read it all day long. <clears throat> um, and of course, I think the remainder of the movies are also filled with um, wonderful symbolism and metaphor, and, and I, I watch them all faithfully all the time. So the first thing I want to share with you is just how do we get the most out of this series? So the first is if you haven't seen the movie or movies, or if you haven't seen them in a while, take some time and watch the movies, at least watch the first movie, okay? The other thing is that we've put together a list of book recommendations uh, on our website. So if you go to the store, you'll see the link for the Matrix, Re Matrix Revisited series. And there are a few books there that I think will help you to deal, dig deeper into what inspired the Wachowskis to uh, create this, this beautiful trilogy. So there's um, one text that I love. It's about seven years old now, seven to ten years old, uh, The Matrix and Philosophy, um, which is a great text. And then there's uh, a, second, uh, a second edition of that book. You can get that. Um, the Matrix is full of uh, Gnosticism. And so uh, The Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels is a great text to look at. Um, also, Jesus and the Lost Goddess by Tim Freak and Peter Gandy uh, deals with Gnosticism and can help you understand the symbolisms. There are other books there, but I'll let you go and take, take a look at them. Also, I invite you, as we mentioned in the synopsis for this series, is that in our first year, um, back in 2013, in July of 2013, we did a sci-fi and spirituality series. And we opened that series with The Matrix, um, and that message was after the red pill. And I invite you to take a, a listen to that message because I'm sort of going to pick up where I left off there, okay, after the red pill. Um, but essentially what I talked about and what I shared in that message was a blueprint for how to navigate life after you take the red pill. And really what happens in our life, there, there may be an initial point when you took the red pill and you moved away from organized religion or traditional religion. You may have taken the red pill and moved into a place of embracing metaphysics or you uh, have taken the red pill and, and decided to study with a, a guru or, or made yoga your path or you've embraced Hinduism or Buddhism or um, uh, some other spiritual path. Um, that's sort of the initial taking of the red pill, but actually life continually asks us, are we going to take the red or the blue pill? And so what would that look like in relationships? What would that look like in our, in our business affairs or in our career? And so I offered a blueprint for how to navigate life after you make that choice. There's some things that are going to happen. It's mirrored in Neo's life, um, and it's also mirrored in uh, a verse in the Gospel of Thomas, and it's mirrored in Plato's Allegory of the Cave, which I talk about in that message. But what I know to be true is that if you are in this room or watching this uh, on YouTube or, or one of our other channels, you've already taken the red pill, right? And that's beautiful. And so what happens, uh, as the Gospel of Thomas um, shares with us in verse 2, it says that those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. And when they find, they will be disturbed, and when they are disturbed, they will marvel and reign over all. And after they have reigned, they will rest. Okay? 
And so what we're going to talk about today is uh, not being disturbed um, and not even marveling. But we're going to talk about this aspect of what does reigning over all look like? And then what does after you've reigned, you rest? What does that look like? So just to backtrack a little bit and just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what's happened in the movie, in the first movie. So we meet Neo and uh, he, we go through a series of events with him, but eventually he takes the red pill. And after he takes the red pill, he finds out what the matrix is. After he finds out what the matrix is, he receives instruction. He receives training from Morpheus. And then Morpheus takes him to meet the Oracle. And the Oracle gives him some information. And after that meeting with the Oracle, Morpheus does something unexpected. Morpheus sacrifices himself so that Neo can be saved. And we find this moment where Morpheus is about to die. He's about to be killed and the codes to the mainframe in Zion are going to be revealed to the agents. And so Neo believes that he can do something about it and decides that he can save Morpheus. And so Neo and Trinity save Morpheus. Yes, yes. We all remember that, right? And after that momentous scene, it's amazing. If you, if you just go back to it. It's an amazing scene. Neo saves Morpheus, and then Trinity is in the helicopter, and, and they shoot the full fuel supply to the helicopter. And so Trinity is also in need of, of saving, and so uh, Neo saves her as well. And after they're safely on top of the building, Morpheus walks over to Neo, and he says these words. Neo, sooner or later, you're going to realize, just as I did, that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And so what we're going to talk about today is what that difference is and why it's important that we must let go of knowing the path and move into walking the path. Now, it's very interesting to me because I think this is a theme that's been going on all year. Um, when we started this year with the What is the New Thought series, um, I talked about the idea of taking one text and focusing on that one text for the entire year. Moving out of this place of, you know, we have our libraries are full. We have all kinds of books from Ernest Holmes to Eckhart Tolle to Louise Hay to whoever the latest Super Soul Sunday author is. We have all of these wonderful books, right? Um, a lot of information, a lot of knowing. Um, but we may not have actually just taken that one book as one tool and fully applied it to our lives. And then on our anniversary Sunday when uh, Reverend August Gold was here, I love the image that she used. She talked about, she described a pair, right? And she said, I can talk to you about this pear, and I can tell you about how juicy it is and how sweet it is, but until you've taken a bite of that pear and made it a part of yourself, you don't know what this pear is all about. It's, that's the difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And then in our four T's class, in, in this first round of four T's, the word that kept coming up over and over again was internalize. Because as we would talk through different scenarios and different students would say, but I know this already. I know this. And Pastor Yolanda would say, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't know this yet. You haven't internalized it. You've read the information. You've read the books. You've read about spiritual law. You've read about the law of attraction. You've read that I create my reality. But until your life reflects it on a consistent basis, that's how you know that you know. And this is what walking the path is all about. It reminded me in, in Scripture in the, in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, where we have that beautiful idea of having a form of godliness but denying the power. And this is what we're doing when we're just knowing the path versus walking the path. See, the truth is, and we know and we celebrate this idea that we are God beings, that we have been created in the likeness and image of God. And just as God can speak, let there be light, and, and there is light, so we can speak uh, our own destiny. We can speak our own potential and expect that and create it. Just as all things emanate from the very mind of God, so all things in our life emanate from our very mind. We understand that. We have a form of godliness, knowing and understanding that, but denying the power because we never actually use it. It just feels good to talk about being holy. It just feels good to talk about being worthy. It just feels good to say I'm perfect, whole, and complete. It feels good to say I am prosperous. It feels good to say I am dot, 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 whatever your current affirmation may be. But are you living the prosperity that you are? Yes. 
Are you living the holiness, wholeness that you are? Are you living the perfection that you are? Are you living the worthiness that you are? Having a form of godliness, understanding and embracing this wonderful, cute idea, but it's only cute (laughs) until you've lived it. It becomes power when it becomes your life. When you can look at a situation and say, that is not me. When you can look at that bank account and deny it and say, that is not the truth of who and what I am. I am abundant. A number does not dictate my abundance. When you can be in a health challenge and recognize that that is still not you. Oh, my goodness. Then we move from knowing the path to walking the path. And so as I was thinking about this idea of knowing the path, as it has so much to do with the amount of knowledge that we've amassed, first let me say this. Knowing the path is a necessary step in the journey. So when we meet Neo in the, in the movie, we find out that he's a bit of a rebel. We find out that he has two lives. He, he lives a, a, a pretty normal life on one hand as Thomas Anderson But then as his conversation with Agent Smith reveals to us, he also has the hacker named Neo. And he's committing all kinds of cyber crimes, um, uh, sort of fighting against the system. And we also find through his conversations with Trinity and with Morpheus that he has a, a foundational belief that is driving him. Morpheus asks him, do you believe in fate? And Neo says, no. I don't like the idea that I don't have control of my life. He was tapping into this recognition, this idea that I believe that I create my reality. I don't know why I believe this, but I'm searching for this answer. And that search is what was leading him to find out what is the matrix. And that search is what was leading him to find Morpheus. And so out of that searching, which we've all been in that place of searching, where we were looking for something, we know there's something more. We heard about, you know, we've heard different things, whatever religious tradition we were born into, but something about that just doesn't completely add up for us. And we begin looking, we begin reading, we begin searching. Somebody may recommend A Course in Miracles to us, or somebody may say, you should go to CSC, because they're talking about something that I think you would like. Whatever it may be, however it unfolded for you or unfolds for you, something brings you um, to this search. And so Neo's search brought him then to Morpheus and Trinity, and he takes the red pill, and then he's introduced to this idea that his external reality is not real at all. He's introduced to the idea that not only is this external reality not real, but an illusion, but he has the power and possibility to manipulate it. When he's in the training program with Morpheus and he has downloaded jujitsu and, and, and has learned martial arts and so Morpheus takes him to see what he's learned. They're fighting and eventually Neo is out of breath and what does Morpheus ask him? Do you think that's air that you're breathing? Do you think my muscles or my strength have anything to do with my ability to beat you in this realm, in this so-called reality? And that so mirrors what we come to know as the truth of our lives when we understand that we can actually manipulate our own surroundings. That life is like a movie screen. And we project our thoughts, our wants, our habits, our beliefs onto the screen. And that means that we can change whatever's on the screen. If we're believing that we're not worthy, maybe because of a situation that happened when we were young, and if we're believing that uh, we can't be wealthy because we've never seen wealth in our family, if we're believing those things and we're only seeing poverty and we're only seeing lack on the screen of our lives, we recognize that we can begin to think a new thought. Yes, yes? And so it may start with affirmations and it may start with denying even what we're seeing that that's not reality. It has no mother. It has no father. I love when Ernest Ernest Holmes says that. Speaking to those things that, that we no longer want to experience and recognizing that it has no mother and it has no father. And so we can allow it to completely dissipate. So we recognize that this, this place of learning is necessary because what happens after that? Of course, um, uh, 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 Neo goes in, into a deeper time of learning more about the matrix and learning what's possible. And then, of course, he goes to the oracle. And she brings him to that wonderful phrase. She brings her, him to the Latin uh, uh, translation of that phrase, know thyself. Again, all about learning. A necessary stage on the journey. So please hear me. I, I, I don't want you to think that uh, you're not supposed to be in knowing. 
But the ultimate idea is that we don't stay there. And what I've come to understand is that many times we do stay there. I call that living on the mountaintop. It's separating ourselves. See, we, at a certain point in life, and, and, and let, let me just, let me speak from the eye. I won't speak from the we. We'll speak from the eye. So I remember Gregory Stamper Jr. After he had this profound awareness in seminary and began to do deeper study and found out that God lives within him, that it is not something that's outside of him, found out that he has power, that he creates his reality and began to prove those principles, Gregory Stamper Jr. got a little arrogant. Gregory Stamper Jr. was a person that was ready, willing, and able to tell people that Santa Claus wasn't real. <laughs> Gregory Stamper Jr. was looking for somebody to get in a debate with to prove to them that the scripture that they had interpreted a certain way didn't mean what they thought it meant, and the person that they thought wrote it didn't actually write it. And so what I was doing, I was living on my mountaintop in my knowingness, but I was also living in separation because there was absolutely no love in what I was doing. No love. No love. And so I began to see myself and I recognized that as love is really the path of all things and the path to anything that I could ever want or desire, I had to bring myself back to a loving place. And that really meant allowing everyone in my life to have the journey that they were having and to bless them and love them and know that if there's anything for me to say, it will come forward easily and effortlessly, that the spirit will allow me and create the situation for me to speak. And over time, what I began to find is that there were those that would seek me out and ask questions because they were ready to hear the information. I didn't have to burst their bubble, their spiritual bubble. It wasn't, it wasn't my job to tell them what they needed to know or to help them unlearn anything. It was only my job to be love, to be love, to be love, <laughs> to be love. And so on the mountaintop, that can be our mountaintop experience sometimes, and it creates separation. Now, for some of us, what it also means is just a fear of getting back into life. Because we recognize how we lived our life previously and how things were going, and now that we've got this information, now we're scared. I, I, I see this many times with people in relationships, um, that uh, 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 so many times uh, we want to create space after a relationship. Now, there's nothing wrong with that inherently, right? You have a, a breakup and you want to create space. I'm working on me, right? We hear that, right? <laughs> right? Now, that's that knowing place. And again, the knowing place is important. But here's the thing about relationships that we don't know is that you actually don't know what you really know or who you are until you are in relationship because relationships are mirrors. And so if you really want to know what you believe, if you really want to know what you're thinking, if you really want to know if you truly know that you're worthy, if you really want to know if you truly know that love is unconditional, get in a relationship. You'll find out real quick. But see, this is a fearless place. This requires courage because you now are choosing to walk the path. Now you have to really pull on them tools. Now you have to pull on that stuff that you read that you were up in the mountaintop holding on to. Now you got to use it. It's real cute to just know the path and have this book. But it's power when you're walking the path and now you take these principles you take what you've read, you take what you've internalized, you take what you've eaten, and now use it. Because I got news for you. It's not like relationships are just going to be peachy cream every single day. Yes, yes, Pastor Elon? All right. All right. But what do, what do we do on a daily basis and on a weekly basis? We use our tools. The same tools that we share here week in and week out and month in and month out, we go to our same tools. That's why we can teach them because we know they work. 
So this is many times, again, what the mountaintop experience looks like. Now, it also reminds me, if you're familiar with the life visioning process, and we've talked about this um, a few times, Reverend Michael Beckwith has brought us this beautiful spiritual technology of the visioning process. He teaches and, and talks about the four stages. And, and I think this is another way to look at this, knowing the path versus the um, walking the path. So stage one and stage two. Stage one is the victim stage. Stage one is when we don't know that we create our reality, when we don't know that the law of attraction is at work, and so we attract unto ourselves our thoughts, our habits, our beliefs. And so we think something's happening to us, and we say things like, why is this happening to me? If you look in the movie, I love this. Neo has that beautiful moment when he's in the office and he gets the FedEx letter, and Morpheus is guiding him to get, how to get away from the agents. We all remember that scene? And he guides him into the office and he says, there's a scaffolding. You got to open the window. You got to go outside. And what does Neo say? Why is this happening to me? He says that in that moment because he was still in this victim stage, right? He didn't know yet that he created his reality. He didn't know that he was the one. He didn't know that he was the savior, the savior of his very own life. And so stage one is where we start and we have to unlearn that stage. And then we come to stage two, which... Um, Fittingly, Reverend Michael calls the manipulator stage. And what this stage is, this is the stage where you begin to understand that you have power, when you begin to understand that you can write out your goals and then achieve them, and you begin to understand that the law of attraction works, and you use the law of attraction to manifest a parking spot, or you use the law of attraction to manifest a trip, or right? right? But what happens when we stay in this stage too long, then we start to try to manipulate life. We're not in the place of allowing life. We're manipulating life. And so it's a stage. It's important, an important stage. But we move beyond that stage to stage three and four. And this is stage three and four is kind of what we're always talking about here at CSC. But stage three and four is the walking the path stage because stage three is the through me stage, that life is happening through me. In stage two, we think life is happening for me which is an important recognition. If you've been a victim and in a victim mindset for so long, to first come to the understanding that life is happening for you is huge. It's groundbreaking. It blows your mind and things change. But then when you understand that, wait, it's not just happening for me or for my good, but it's actually happening through me, it's a new level of power. It's also a new level of responsibility, but this is walking the path now. And then finally we get to the stage of stage four, which life is happening as me. And that's the stage of no separation. And if you fast forward through the, to, the, to the last movie, to the third movie, what happens with Neo is that after he's realized all of this power and he can fly and he's actually come to this place where he can use his abilities in the machine world and in the human world because there is no separation, right? What happens is then he has to plug in. He goes to the machine city, and he becomes one with everything. That's actually how he saves Zion and the machine world, because he became one with everything. Life was happening as him, right? That's the ultimate stage that we want to get to. And so when we sing songs like we've sung today, that the universe is responding to me, that I create my reality, this is that world. This is that place of living and understanding that life is happening through me and life is happening as me. I got two more points that I want to share. One of the ways I like to describe walking the path versus knowing the path is echoed in something that the oracle says to Neo in his first meeting with her. If you recall, that meeting was about him finding out if he was the one. He meets other potentials who had wonderful powers as well. And the conversation with him, she says this. She says, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love. You just know it. Through and through. Balls to bones. Walking the path is just like being in love. Nobody can tell you the power that you have, you just know it. You stand in this knowingness, and out of this knowingness, you are able to shift and change your life. Out of this pure knowingness, like knowing that you're in love and nobody can tell you otherwise, you're able to speak a word and things change. Out of this knowingness, 
you're able to change any circumstance and bring forth miracles. Now, it's interesting that she says it's like being in love. I shared this in the after the red pill message, but it's so important, I think, as we continue to move forward in this month. The Matrix, the first movie, opens in a hotel, and the name of that hotel is Heart of the City, and we meet Trinity in that awesome scene. When Neo realizes that he's the one and is running away from Agent Smith before, he's, before Neo is, is killed and then resurrected, he comes back to the same hotel, heart of the city. The symbolisms in, in these movies are very specific. The Matrix takes place in the heart chakra. There's a through line of love from the beginning to the end of the movie. Now, what's interesting is what is the color of the heart chakra? What is the color of the matrix? The matrix takes place in the heart. Now, the heart chakra represents this place that is unhurt, unstruck, or unbeaten. It's this place, as it's described, that sound is made, but it doesn't require the clashing of two opposing forces. Because that's what love is. It doesn't require any clashing. And so when we're able to live from this place, from the level of the heart, what we're able to do is actually live beyond, uh, as some would describe, the laws of karma, or I'll just say beyond duality and beyond cause and effect and beyond fate, which echoes this conversation that Morpheus and Neo had, that Neo did not believe in fate because he did not like the idea he doesn't have control over his life. When we were living at the level of the heart, When we're living in the heart chakra, in the heart of the city, we've now moved into this place. We're walking the path, recognizing that we are no longer controlled by the swinging of the pendulum. If you know about the Kabbalion, if you've read or studied the Kabbalion, right? You know that the Kabbalion teaches that we can actually rise above that rhythm swing of the pendulum and actually neutralize and stay in this steady, aligned, centered place. That's the level of the heart. That's where the heart chakra is. And so when we're walking the path, we're able to live in this place. So finally, as you're watching the movies, know this. Every character is an aspect of you. You are Neo. You are Morpheus. You are Trinity. And the agents represent your thoughts. Now, Neo represents belief. Neo is the Christ figure. He's the savior. If we know about the Christ or we know about the Buddha, that's a Piscean energy. And the the mantra of Pisces is, I believe. And so if you watch the first movie, you'll hear Neo constantly saying, I believe. The reason he was able to save Morpheus is because he believed that he could do it. That's what he said, I believe that I can do this. And then when we see him fighting Agent Smith and they're saying, what is he doing? What does Morpheus say? He's beginning to believe. Because that's the power of the Christ. It's belief. Trinity represents love. And, the, and Morpheus represents faith. We're going to do a whole message on faith. I can't wait to talk to y'all about Morpheus. He's bad. When you understand that Morpheus is faith and he's your faith. And so you're watching how your faith can operate in your life if you allow it. Oh, my goodness. It's powerful. So when we take this idea of belief, love, and faith. And we recognize that these are ancient allegories. It's the same thing as heart, mind, and courage. Same thing. We did the Wizard of Oz a couple summers ago. And so when I say that the agents represent your thoughts, the agents represent fear, doubt, and worry. Or any of those unwanted thoughts that do not serve your highest good. And it's interesting because of the way the agents show up on the scene. If you watch the movie... Trinity or Morpheus or Neo, when they're fighting the police, they're just fighting regular humans, right? And then all of a sudden, the agents take over their bodies. That just mirrors our life, doesn't it? Because as you're walking through life and you're doing something, you decide to create a business or you decide to pursue a new relationship and everything is fine. And then all of a sudden, an agent of doubt shows up. An agent of worry shows up. That's all those agents represent. But what's beautiful is you have the power to destroy them. So in this moment, I invite everybody to stand. There is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And this month, we are making a choice 
to begin walking the path. And what does walking look like? It means internalizing now. Not just speaking out affirmations because they feel good. Walking the path also, you know, there, there are so many people that, um, and there are books now that have been written that are debunking positive thinking and calling us a bunch of silly people. And there's some validity to what they're saying because so many of us are simply knowing the path and not walking the path. We have to come to this place of now applying what we've learned. Take one tool, any tool, whatever that tool is that feels good to you, that you've been thinking about using or talking about using, begin to use it. If you took the prayer class and you haven't prayed since you took the class, start using the five steps of affirmative prayer in your life. Right? If you took one of our prosperity class or you took Pastor Yolanda, one of her Course in Miracles classes, and now that book is just sitting on the shelf collecting dust, representing a time in your life when you read A Course in Miracles, maybe it's time to start using it in your daily practice. Start affirming it. It's a, it's a very interesting thing, and my life has proven it. One of the most challenging lessons that I love in the course, it says, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. Teaching us that we don't have to defend or protect ourselves. My life changed when I actually applied that to a real situation. That I, everything in my life was screaming, defend, 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 protect, 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 build a wall, build a wall, build a wall. Donald Trump needs to hear that lesson. Yes, yes. In our defenselessness, our safety lies. We have no one to fear. As a country, this is a new consciousness that we need to develop. When we as a country develop that consciousness, then we'll change who's in the White House. But the truth is he's reflecting something that we believe in our individual lives. We think we, we need to defend. We think we need to defend ourselves when we get in relationships so we kind of half get in but still protect our hearts. We defend ourselves when, when, when we're starting a new business, but we don't fully put ourselves all the way out there because we're scared. I don't know if I can really do this. Let me protect myself. Let me still keep one foot in the nine to five. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. He's only reflecting to us our consciousness. Thank God for that, brother. He's reflecting back to us what we need to change within ourselves because when we change our consciousness, the White House, Congress, the Supreme Court will change. I know that to be true. And so we take a breath in this moment. Mother, Father, God, we stand here now with gratitude and thanksgiving for the path of knowing. We are grateful and thankful for the moment that we took the red pill and we chose to create a new experience in our lives, that we took the red pill and we received new ideas, we received new information, we received new instruction. We are grateful and thankful for the moment after we took the red pill and we were introduced to the trinities of our lives and we were introduced to the Morpheuses of our lives and we were introduced to the oracles of our lives. We are grateful and thankful for that time of unlearning and that time of new learning. But we recognize now that we must move ahead. We must move forward and actually become the saviors of our lives. In order to become the saviors of our lives, we must walk the path. And so we believe something is possible for our lives. We believe that we can thrive. As we are choosing to be the saviors of our lives, we believe a new possibility for our lives. We believe that we can have perfect, harmonious, loving relationships. We believe something new for our lives. We believe that we can be wealthy. We believe that we can create a business that not only sustains us, but sustains our family. We believe right here and right now that we can have a new experience in our bodies. We believe that good health is possible. We believe that healing is possible. We believe that our cells are responding to us and coming back in line with the truth of our very being. We believe. We choose to access and stand in the power of this belief and use it for our benefit. We are choosing to now internalize all that we have learned so that we may actualize it in our lives. I speak a word of blessing over each and every person in this room, for I recognize that each and every person in this room is a savior, is a Christ, is a Buddha, is an awakened one, it is an enlightened one. And I am grateful and thankful to be a witness to their revelation, to their revealing, to their unfolding of their greatest lives. For I know the truth that as we are alive, there is something more for us to express on this planet. I bless your expressions now and I bless your future expressions. 
and I call it good. For this, I am so very grateful. I release this prayer now, and together we say amen. Amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. So it is. Thank you, God.